Hello. Oh, hey. Oh, hey. Hello. Calling Chris well, Anderson. What you're in? I think you're in London. I am. I'm making. A, I'm gonna, came home to check my mail. You're at your home base. You're at the I London first, headquarters of History Happy uh, Hour. Getting ready for the Battle of Britain tour. So uh, yeah. So and calling Rick Byer in. It looks like you're back in, in the Windy City. Yeah, I am. I'm back in the in the office here I, uh, for the next couple of shows. I hope. And um, you know, I I did. I was away. I did take a vacation week, as I know you did. I heard. It. I did. Week. I was in Fanjou. And and you were also in uh, Edinburgh for a while. I so was. Uh, you were in some very good places. But uh, I went kayaking and I I dropped my iPhone. I didn't really drop it. I but I lost it in the water in the rushing water of us. You've been very water. athletic and it just flew out. In a, in Inlet. Way. Yes, yes. I was making some powerful Questing the waves or something, yes. <laughs> and uh, But you know what? Amazing story, Chris. My phone spent 20 hours underwater. Under the sea. Salt and water, you know, ocean inlet. And the guide who'd led us in the kayak tour actually found it at low tide right. the following afternoon. She pulled it out of the water and she said it started buzzing and messages started coming in. And, and lo and behold, it's still working. So... Um, uh, so so are you paid by Apple for this endorsement? Or I, I don't, you know, I really think I should get a lot of money. I think so. Apple endorsement. I should probably do a commercial. They should sponsor. I, I think so. History happy hour. What are we, but, why know, are we, we shouldn't even be talking about it unless they sponsor us. We Apple. should be counting the money they're going to send us. Brought to you by Apple. Apple. Yeah. we could. Sorry, you care, but that, yeah, an Apple logo. It, it'd yeah. be awesome. Uh, by well, the way, um, I, I, I got a question though, but since you lost it for 20 hours, yes. does that mean you immediately ran home, bought a new phone? Yes. Assuming you would... Okay, good. So now you have two phones. Yes. I have this phone. <laughs> <laughs> one for the beach, one for the top. Can tub. you hear it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I, I called um, uh, Verizon to get a uh, return label to ship this back, and they had trouble emailing it to me. So they said, oh, well, we'll just mail it to you. So, I, okay, I don't know what's going on. But anyway, I have another 23 days, I think, before I have to return this This wasn't this a phone, secret so. plot to just get a new phone, was it? No, no. In fact, I almost if if I almost kept the new phone and gave the old phone to my daughter and decided uh, that I'll it's easier just to buy her a new phone. So. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome everybody to History uh, Happy Hour. We yeah. will eventually talk about history. Nah. It's brought to you not by Apple, but by Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And Chris and I may travel the globe, uh, but sometimes we're forced to come back home yeah, for tax for reasons sure. wow. or other <laughs> purposes <laughs> and talk about history from our very own high-tech home studios. Uh, and today we have an Encore episode, the last of a month of Encore episodes, which was going to focus on the Alamo. And Chris, oh, as always, really a thank you to everybody who supports us on Patreon, yeah. patreon.com slash history happy hour. Please, there's room for more names on this list. This is just our Apple top right show down patrons. There the yeah, that we, we'll give them their home page if they want it. Wow, okay. And a reminder that you can find out about upcoming shows on our website, historyhappyhour.net. And uh, the show that we're about to rebroadcast, Chris, I, I thought it was a terrific show. Absolutely uh, fascinating. With the authors of Forget the Alamo. Uh, actually, yep. one of the authors uh, are kind of a not revisionist history so much as let's look at what the actual history is and why yep. we've been teaching revisionist history for yes. 200 years. Well, and also a wonderful look at you know, the uses that history is put to that might not be uh, the nefarious kind of, uses yes, that history is put absolutely. to and also uh, a show full of kind of fun and, and interesting stories. So uh, uh, check it out. Enjoy it. And Chris, why don't you get us started here? <laughs> Is open. The bar is open, and what's on tap today, Chris? Yeah, well, um, we've got a very interesting topic. We're leaving kind of our, our familiar ground here, and also a very controversial topic. Uh, we're going to be joined tonight by Brian Burrow, who is the co-author, along with Chris Tomlinson and Jason Stanford, of Forget the Alamo, a new historiographical look at the Alamo and the uses and misuses of history. Uh, and this is a book that uh, author Robert Draper has called an all too timely tale of how fable told forcefully and frequently enough makes its insidious way into history books. 
Uh, Burroughs is the author of six books, including Days of Rage, The Big Rich, Public Enemies, and co-author of the New York Times number one bestseller, Barbarians at the Gate. And I should also point out uh, that he lives in Texas, so that kind of gives him some legitimacy in what we're going to be talking about. <laughs> And, and and now, Brian, you're also a veteran of History Happy Hour. There you go. And whatever Your career accolade. pinnacle has happened. Cheers. So, Cheers. Excellent. We, uh, if, I don't know if you have a cocktail, but we, I'm, I'm drinking beer today, Chris. And yeah. well, I couldn't Brian's find a, I couldn't find a Lone Star here in London, but I got a Soul. So I guess that's um, close enough. Be as close as I can get. Yeah. yeah. Close enough. Well, Brian, welcome so, so much to the show. And Chris, I'm going to let you start off the questioning. Yeah, the interrogation. Want, interrogation. Inter yeah, author yeah. interrogation. Well, I want to start with um, just a passage from the book. Um, and this is, this is from, from the book. And it says, it, uh, the Alamo, its legend comprises the beating heart of Texas exceptionalism. The idea deeply held among generations of Texans that the state is special somehow a cut above the Delawares and Rhode Islands of the world. Mm -hmm. Its story, as Steinbeck suggests, is thus prized as a kind of civic religion. It's not an overstatement to say that the Alamo is the state's secular western wall, its secular Mecca. Somewhat as Jews and Muslims have struggled over the Temple Mount, so Anglos, African American, Mexican American, Tejanos, and Native Americans are now debating the future of the Alamo and its meaning. So, Given the heavy weight of its meaning and its history, what were you thinking by diving into this project? I think my co-authors would tell you guys that I didn't know. <laughs> and I, was, I grew up in Texas, but I was gone for 30 years. And this is the first book that I've written back while back in Texas about Texas. And, you know, this set out to be kind of a lark, something we would, a secondary book, a little art film book that we would do on at nights and the weekends. And it became a much bigger book in terms of the story we ended up telling. Uh, but then when it dropped in Texas, it's, it dropped with an impact. Um, and I guess I was naive not to understand how holy uh, this legend is. Not only the legend of the Alamo, but the whole legend of the Texas Revolution. And to challenge the history of that, the facts of that, to try to reclaim what actually happened as opposed to the beloved legend um, sure has irked a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, Brian, your your book is, is called, I, I'm not going to go with the long excerpt like Chris, I'm going to go much shorter. Your book is called Forget the Alamo. Clearly, you don't want us to forget the Alamo because you just wrote a book about it. But <laughs> well, what should we remember and what should we forget? Well, Forget the Alamo was, I mean, if you're going to write a provocative title on Texas history, that is the title, right? I mean, yeah. you kind of have to go with it. But yes, we're, we're, we're not trying to get people to forget the facts of it, but to forget the myths associated with it. And there were generally two sets of myths that the book and I and Chris and Jason have addressed. And that is the myths about the battle itself the lead up, what actually happened, because so little is understood about what actually happened, but also the bigger questions of the Texas Revolution, why it was being fought, what it was even about, that type of stuff. Um, the legend of it all that's been accepted and taught here for going on 200 years is, frankly, much of it is not supported by the facts of history. And uh, once we realized that, that academics over the last 30, 40 years have really constructed a new picture of the Texas Revolution and the battle itself. That's when we thought, wow, there's grounds here for a popular history defined as when aging middle-aged white journalists like me dive into the um, academic scholarship and attempt to pre present it in, uh, in an accessible way to them. Okay, so but Brian, for those of us who aren't from Texas, I mean, we have a general idea maybe about about the the revolution and what happens at the Alamo. But just for for our viewers what what's the baseline what's the myth that is kind of the wait, accepted wait you don't know all this by heart you well i have a... <laughs> i didn't go to the table on saint jacinto day um no i my my father-in-law used to but i i used to shut that out but um, accepted, no so what's the accepted myth is that um what's known is that in 1821 uh, the newly independent nation of Mexico, uh, eyeing its um, lonely, uh, sparsely settled northern province of Texas, 
uh, which was threatened by persistent Comanche raids, needed some people there as kind of a buffer. And a bunch of Americans decided they'd like to come in and settle and farm cotton. They were invited in. And 15 years later, they revolted. Um, the legend has always been that they revolted for their freedom because Mexico was oppressing them. And frankly, that just doesn't bear out. They were as free, in fact, freer. Uh, they had more, uh, they were given more laws um, than just about anybody in Mexico. And there's really nothing to support the idea that they were oppressed. Once they revolted, the president of Mexico, uh, Santa Ana, uh, marches in to put down the revolt. The first battle of significance is at the Alamo in March of 1836. And there, uh, as everybody knows, um, you know, a small group of 180 some odd Texans was overwhelmed by, by something like 6,000 Mexico Mexicans killed to a man, but their time of their fight delayed Santa Ana long enough for the legendary Sam Houston to raise an army, which then defeated uh, Santa Annie at the Battle of St. Sino six weeks later. Unfortunately, not only is that really not supported by facts, the timing, the delay bit, um, but a lot of the whole what happened, the idea that they that they fought to the to the last man, um, that they you know, the fact is we now know from Mexican accounts they offered to surrender, and Santa Anna wouldn't take it. No, they didn't no, fight no, the, don't, they didn't don't fight say the that. Man. As many as half of them ran out in the open and were run down by Mexican cavalry. And, I mean, it wasn't quite the heroic legend in every regard um, that we've come to believe. It's what I grew up with, in, you know, in Texas. We all take uh, Texas history in seventh grade. Um, it's more than history here. Um, this is Texas identity. It is the heart of the idea of Texas exceptional exceptionalism, which is Silly as it may sound, if you're in Chicago or Rhode Island, it's a very real thing here. And it's a thing that people care deeply about. And if we didn't know that before, we now know it from the reaction to this book. And, and, I, and I'm just going to say I am from Rhode Island, and it's, it's a, which you've now mentioned twice already. And uh, it's a fine state. And uh, we'll, we'll have words about that later. And someday it'll grow up and be Massachusetts. Right, but that's maybe, another someday story. Maybe, yeah, yeah, smart, you smart remarks, Chris. So um, I imagine uh, – let's, 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 let's look at some of the pieces of this, Brian. I imagine that one thing that has caused uh, a, a lot uh, – hit a nerve with people is the assertion that the underlying cause of this rebellion – is actually slavery that the people uh the anglos uh who were settling in texas were fighting in essence to preserve slavery and i'm sure that having written about that you get people saying oh brian that's just a lot of woke crap that you're you know spinning because of the way things are these days but in fact uh, it's right there in all the documents right it's right there in all the letters of stephen austin and everybody else if you go back and you read the correspondence of the, the father of Texas, Stephen F. Austin, who was the head of the colony, the founding father of the colony, he spent more time probably in Mexico City and elsewhere fighting for the rights for the Texans to keep slaves and just about any other issue. Um, the fact was um, for the Texans, for the American colonists in Mexico, um, this slavery was primarily an, an, an economic issue, not a moral issue. They came to uh, farm cotton, and in, the, in their minds, they had to have slaves um, or, you know, they would be penniless. The, Mex the new Mexican government, as backward as generations of Americans have wanted to portray it, was fiercely abolitionist, uh, was against slavery, and uh, did their best to outlaw in Texas again and again. And every time Austin would say, that's it. If you outlaw slavery, we're done. Everybody's going home, which was true. And every time the Mexicans said, OK, OK, we'll give you another year, another 18 months, but then no more slaves. And eventually this went on for 15 years. And we argue in the book and a lot of academics now argue um, that that was the underlying uh, cause. That was the theme that drove the two sides apart. Um, yes, the trigger had to do. Uh, with with taxes, but no one's actually gone in and argued that this was a tax revolt. Um, the fact was there was only one thing that the two sides ever fought about with regularity, and that was 
um, that was slavery. And in the documentation that, that swirls through the revolt, in the Constitution, it's never, of course, called slavery that they were fighting for, because that wasn't cool even in 1836. It was always referred to as property, their, their property rights, um, because the Texans had more, given most of their land was free, they had far more capital invested in uh, slavery than in any other um, asset uh, of the economy. Um, so it was a huge deal for the Texans. So, and Brian, one of the things that I've always been been curious about is clearly, you know, there's, there's immigration into Texas. Um, they're invited by the Mexican government, Americans, uh, to to settle settle in Texas. But there are people already there. What um, what if any part do I don't want to say na if native is the right word, but but Tejan, uh, Mexican American Tejanos, uh, how do they, they view this? Well, what you have to remember is there weren't many of them. Uh, after a, a, a previous revolt in the 1812 time frame, um, most of the people in Texas were either dead or had fled. There were circa 1820, a grand total of three towns in Texas holding maybe 4,000 people. And need I point out, there are, before the pandemic, there are office buildings in New York that have more people in them who were in the entire state of 1820 of Texas in 1821 when the Texans first started coming in. Now, uh, the Tejanos that were there, mostly centered, the money ones uh, were in San Antonio, were entirely supportive of the American presence. It was good for com commerce. Uh, and they became uh, old families like the Seguins, became kind of the diehard allies of the American colonists, both before fighting broke out and when the fighting broke out. Uh, a lot of Tejanos uh, rode with the Texans and fought at, Sa at uh, San Jacinto. And, and is, is their story part of the narrative? It is. It's a big part of the narrative, and it's a big part of the, something that we wanted to put back because the, the legend of Texas birth is so Anglo-centric and so dominated by what white folks did. Not that there's you know anything wrong with that, but the fact is, what got left out was the contribution of the Tejanos. And, you know, they were written out of history, much like they were pushed out of the, pushed out of the state after the revolution in a kind of really ugly ethnic cleansing uh, in which a lot of their, you know, livestock and their farm, their land was, was taken. And as that happened, as the Tejanos emerged into a, a new Anglo-centric society of kind of grinding racism and poverty, they were henceforth written out of Texas history. I mean, if you go back and you read just about all the histories in the 1800s and, and into the 1900s, you'd hardly even know there were people. You know, they, a lot of these books refer to Texas as a wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the idea that there were people there who were deeply involved in this cause, in this revolution, uh, was largely lo lost to history until the first generation of Mexican-American historians began emerging from PhD programs in the 60s and 70s. And a lot of what we know now, uh, the totality of it began began then and has evolved over the last 50 years. We stand on uh, uh, the shoulders and, and the book Forget the Alamo stands on the shoulders of an awful lot of academics who have done this work uh, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and, and, and especially just in the last 20 years, began beginning to look at the at the importance of slavery to all this. That was kind of the last, kind of the third rail that nobody really wanted to go against for so long because it was so controversial. Uh, Brian, I, I want to remind everybody that we are talking here today with Brian Burrow, who's one of the authors of Forget the Alamo, uh, uh, which is a, a recent book out and a terrific book uh, to take a look at. And Brian, um, so, so we... We're moving. We're going to move, we're move slowly into deeper waters here as we go. Uh, let's talk about the three best known heroes uh, of the Alamo story: Davy Crockett, Jim Bowie, uh, William Travis. Now, now, don't break our hearts, but uh, maybe not exactly the heroes as portrayed by uh, by Fess Parker or the other actors uh, who portrayed them over the years. Rick, 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 not hero. They're the holy trinity. That is the accepted okay. phrase in Texas. I'm not making this up for Crockett, uh, Bowie, and Travis. Um, look, Davy Crockett was not exactly the Davy Crockett uh, of the Disney movies 
as I think most of us know, he was a doughy, paunchy, 49-year-old former t- Tennessee congressman, uh, very famous in his day for kind of his corn pone hillbilly, hillbilly act, which was very popular until it wasn't, who came to Texas with a, a bunch of pals trying to get, you know, something, some land, certainly, we clearly Crockett, like his peer, Sam Houston, who came to Texas earlier, was looking for some type of political office, perhaps in an independent uh, Texas. Jim Bowie is the one whose real story most surprised me. Of course, Bowie is kind of the, the, the Steve McQueen of the Alamo, the brooding, uh, dark, fighting man who, who is felled by drink and, and sickness. Um, and in fact, we know Bowie, who was also famous in his day, due largely to a, a, a duel he fought in 1827, um, which popularized the Bowie knife, by the way. He, he turns out to be, um, he comes out to be a, um, well, pretty much a criminal. Um, <laughs> Bowie is best known, uh, at least in legal history, as the purveyor of two massive land frauds in Louisiana and an attempted one in, in Arkansas, in which he dummied up, you know, literally hundreds of Spanish land grants that he could then take. And he came to Texas um, after an earlier career as an illegal slave trader, a trader in illegal slaves from Cuba. Um, he came to Texas like a lot of people did, frankly, back in, back then, uh, with, um, with the law one step behind him. Uh, the fact is, if Jim Bowie had not immigrated to Texas, if he'd stayed back in his native Louisiana, there's a good chance he would have ended up swinging at the end of a rope. But uh, Travis, uh, you know, Travis came, as is widely known, uh, to escape bad debts in his native uh, Alabama. But I think what m- most people find objectionable uh, about Travis is just he was a, a histrionic, incredibly self-righteous Southern racist, um, uh, but don't know, sugarcoat it for us, Brian. <laughs> we can take it. You know, he was a, he was a guy who kept a journal in which he you know he he kept you know uh, detailed notes on every woman woman he ever slept with, um, which did end up uh, leaving him with some type of uh, uh, STD, some type of venereal disease, for which he took a blue pill, which almost certainly was mercury which almost certainly could explain some of his more erratic behavior, the sudden pulling of a knife on, a, on a, a, another lawyer in open court, this type of thing. But Travis, despite his obvious uh, differences, um, was a brilliant writer. The reason that we talk about the Alamo today is not because 180 odd men died there. It's because William Barrett Travis wrote these incredible letters asking for help uh, from the state, uh, from the from the the, the morning, uh, state government, and they were beautifully written. They were, you know, he was a master of spin. He, if Travis were alive today, he would not be commander of the Alamo. He would be a PR man on Madison Avenue because he sure knew how to write. And it was the enshrinement of those letters posthumously that really as much as anything, uh, made the Alamo into the legend that it's become. And so about the legend, though, Brian, so these 186 men, they pretty much get sent by Houston, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but kind of on a fool's errand. They get kind of left to left to hang. There's a desultory bombardment of the, of, of the Alamo. The Santa Ana says enough is enough. He storms it. It's over pretty quick. They're dead. Yep. Not very glorious, pretty gory, over pretty quick. So how does the legend of what happened there start? I mean, who who's saying, okay, let's turn this into something? The legend starts with two things. One is Travis's letters. The second is when Sam Houston realized that his little army of 900 men didn't have much chance against Santa Ana's incoming uh, Mexican army. And, you know, he needed, he needed men with high morale. He needed men who felt they were fighting for something larger than themselves and larger than their, their own lives. And he came up with, of course, uh, remember the Alamo. And the first time that history reports that the words were spoken was during the initial charge of the Texans at San Jacinto, uh, when uh, a colonel on the, on the left 
yelled, remember the Alamo, remember Goliath, which was another slaughter uh, of Texans, more Texans, twice as many had uh, outside the town of Goliath. And because remember out, remember the Alamo was being shouted uh, during the victory at San Jacinto, it became the slogan uh, after the fact of the Texas Revolution. And then as you know, a mass of Anglo Americans moves into Texas afterwards and begins regarding this whole new land, where did it come from? They start writing histories. As when Texas is brought into the Union ten years later, there's another surge of books trying to appraise what is this place? Where did it come from? What's it what's it about? And all of them enshrined the this myth that was then so fresh. It was five, 10, 15 years old of these incredible men who gave their all uh, at the Alamo to buy the time for this incredible battle at San Jacinto. Um, and, you know, the legend just was not challenged in, in any serious way until the 1900s. That's the first serious thing. Remember the famous story about the line being drawn in the sand? Right. That's probably the most famous uh, myth of the Alamo. And we now know, as academics have before us, that um, this was made up uh, by a gentleman, uh, an amateur historian in circa the 1885, 1882 uh, range. It was accepted uh, as reality there for 30, 40 years and made, it, it's made its way into the dominant Texas history textbooks uh, until it was finally kind of challenged in the early 1900s. Um, so even a hundred years ago, there was a question um, agitating in Texas about what really happened and what kind of can we say happened. Um, and that percolated for what? Going on a century until now you've had some, ac some academic history and now a, a, a significant popular history, I would call our book, that tries to put this all into one place where ordinary people can begin to recapture the Alamo of history and not the Alamo of legend. So uh, one of our viewers, Gail Wright, mentions that uh, uh, it, it became even more of a legend with the Disney portrayal and the John Wayne portrayal, both of which you write about in the book. And Walt Disney's involvement in kind of uh, creating uh, the Davy Crockett hero image is is pretty huge. I mean, for a person of my age, uh, without giving away what that age is, uh, the iconic Alamo image is Fess Parker on the ramparts swinging old Betsy at yeah. legions of Mexican soldiers who apparently don't want to shoot at him from a distance but want to come up and get clubbed by old Betsy uh, before he's overwhelmed. And when, when I researched and wrote a little bit about Davy Crockett 15 years ago, and again, saw it again in your book, I was surprised to discover that according to accounts from Mexican soldiers, because yes, there are accounts from Mexican soldiers, that and Davy- the only accounts. What? <laughs> They're the only accounts. They're the only, They're the only <laughs> accounts, yes. But, but, but it's like some people are like, well, you, nobody knows what happened because everybody died. And it's no that, Oh, that just about crazy. <laughs> not everybody. <laughs> no, no, actually, there were, there were Mexicans. Died that, that lived and they didn't just the kill story. themselves on the spot. So they not only told the story in memoirs, they told stories in, in actual memos written the next morning. This type of thing. I mean, there were after action reports of the of the Alamo in archives at Mexico City. Then there's no real reason to doubt most yeah, of but, all of them because they agree. Uh, but you're right. But, your but, point, but Davy's final moments are somewhat at odds with the myth, right? So the, tell us the, about the that. caller or the, the, the person who, who weighed in. Um, makes an excellent point, and they're covered, I think, in chapters 15 and 16, which my uh, co-author Chris Tomlinson spearheaded for us. And until the World War II 1950s era, uh, it's fair to say that the Alamo legend was primarily a Texas thing. It would be cited by Texas politicians, you know, every year on the anniversary, that type of thing. But it was the Disney Al the Disney David Crockett. Uh, which was three, what, three television movies, at the end of which, of course, climaxes with the Alamo. And more than anything, the John that. Wayne movie in 1960 that really brought the Alamo myth, the Alamo legend to the broader world. It made it first a national thing, and then Wayne really, the movie as bad as it was in some ways, and it's pretty bad in terms of its perpetuation of the myth and the Anglo-centrism, um, really made it into an international, into a global myth. Uh, you know, there are people 
Chris, where you are in London that, that know that know this story now that probably wouldn't have known it, you know, before John Wayne. Um, and, you know, the, so the height of the Alamo myth, it, which follows closely, closely after that in 1960, of course, our first Texas president, LBJ, who is the biggest Alamo head there's ever been, and Al- Alamo head being what we call Alamo enthusiasts. You know, um, LBJ would recite Alamo poetry at state dinners. Um, he would he loved Alamo and analogies but talking about Vietnam. Never mind that everybody died at the Alamo. Then sometimes it wasn't. <laughs> but, the, but these events from 1955 to say 1970 really took a quaint regional myth and made it into a big internationally known uh, legend. And for that, really, it's you, you have to thank or blame uh, Walt Disney, John Wayne, and LBJ. But but I but I need to but I need to know what what do we know about what happened to Davy Crockett and was oh, he up well, there on the ramparts fighting with Old Bess? There are no accounts that I know of of history of anyone saying that that's the way he fought that that's the way he passed. Uh, we know that version. It's very strange that version. Um, it, that legend seems to have come from Walt Disney because if you go back to the 1830s, all the accounts are that Crockett surrendered and was executed as in fact all the mexican counts i believe there's seven all agree that he was among the seven or eight who surrendered maybe he begged for his life we don't really know um but he was but he was executed um uh, the, the this idea of swinging old betsy till he died that's from Walt Disney. that's from john wayne and it really wasn't until the 70s when people started looking at mexican counts going wait you know that's a great story, but there's absolutely no evidence to support the idea that he. Well, went there's off. only there's only seven accounts. You said. I mean, is seven? I don't know. Is that enough? Maybe it should be eleven or fourteen before we really believe it. You know, I don't think a lot of people are writing the history and say and just saying without attribution that he died because it's always that he that he that he surrendered because it's it's always been so yeah. uh, fraught, uh, but. Unfortunately, there is no evidence that I'm recalling offhand on a Sunday afternoon with a glass of wine that he went down fighting. In fact, all the evidence is to the contrary. Right. No, no. I, I, so, I, I'm, I'm sure it is. I, so, Brian, one of the things I'm curious, is, is over the course of my career, I, I've, you know, college, grad school, et cetera, et cetera, I've had to take a lot of historiography courses. And, and I get that a historical event, you know, that there are interpretations – 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years after an event that kind of be a little colored, a little romantic. But over time, you know, people look at it again. They revise the story, the narrative. It evolves. But this story just is stuck in this. It, it just never moved. And that's one of the things I found so fascinating. So maybe kind of sketch out broadly what, how that happened, the historiography. So, so did I. Why was it? I mean, in... in in the, in the 80s and the 90s, you saw the first uh, Texas historians actually saying exactly that point, Chris. Why hasn't this changed when we all know that it's really not true? Um, um, in fact, the main reason is um, Texas politicians. Going back to 1898, when the first one rose on the floor of the Texas legislature and, and decried uh, some newcomer in the Texas History Department who was teaching something that wasn't sufficiently pro-Southern, the Texas government has been uh, very proactive in protecting the Texas myth. Um, The dominant faculty that teaches Texas history uh, for a century has, and perhaps uh, could still be seen as, uh, is the University of Texas. And the University of Texas uh, was run by, uh, the University of Texas History Department was run by a, uh, a, a group of uh, older white men who, from around 1905 until around 1955, taught the pretty much the exact same story because they knew that's the way Texas politicians and the legislature wanted it taught. And so you see the exact same story, legend, being taught in 1955 that was being taught in 1855. Right. Texas government wanted that way. And so you may say, well, why didn't that change? It started to change in the academic literature, probably in the 80s and 90s. But as late as, and, and as that, some of that began to filter into the conversation over textbooks, 
that's where it started to get really hot in the early part of this century. You can look back on this great debate about, uh, uh, about the Alamo that's happened at the, the, the education department. And we, we actually have a rule handed down in either 2010 or 2011 that actually says it is the law of Texas that uh, Texas history teachers must teach that all defenders of the Alamo were, quote, heroic, that they were all heroes. It must, it must be taught. And when that, those rules were up for review two or three years ago, and, you know, pretty much every, polit every professor and high school teacher on that panel that looking at drafting standards said, you know, that's maybe that's not, um, you know, the, the, the state is about to be majority Latino. Maybe that's maybe it's time we put that myth to, maybe. to, to bed. And the governor of Texas at the time, Greg Abbott, who is still our governor today, basically spearheaded a massive attack on these people. Uh, online and uh, so it's still the law of the land that the defenders of the Alamo must be portrayed and taught as uh, heroic, which is it's it's I don't even know what to say. That, that that about sums it up. I mean, because I, I mean I understand and I understand the popular history, obviously, and I, I understand writing to please an audience. And but one of the things that you point out that's so interesting in, in this whole drama is that. You have highly skilled professional historians, people that know that you're supposed to go look at the sources from the other side and you're supposed to filter all through all the information. And they're they're giving it a pass, which I, I just found really startling. We're actually seeing this right now. When the book came out this summer, obviously, it was pretty controversial down here. The lieutenant governor, as you may know, canceled an appearance of ours at the State History Museum. And, you know, we've talked with a lot of academics and you know almost all of them you know many of them work at state universities and they just say look this is nothing we can pipe up about we can't say we can write it in the academic literature and they have this book i don't want to say there's nothing new in forget the alamo but we are summarizing decades of academic accepted academic scholarship here and to have some politicians uh, uh, attack us is fact free when in fact exactly the opposite is the case we we are presenting what is the agreed upon academic view of Texas history and the Alamo now. And so it's, it's a little sad to see people who are not schooled in the details, um, you know, uh, try to shut people up who actually just want to present history as it actually happened. Well, I, and I will say as, as a reader, uh, and not exactly a reviewer, that the book struck me as thoughtful and well-researched and not particularly strident or political or fact-free in any way. And, and I mean, I, 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 I don't want to uh, damn you with faint praise, but I, I would almost say mild. I mean, it's not, there wasn't, as you said, there, there, there's some new stuff in there, but there wasn't anything that was shocking. It was- Look, Rick, you, you put your finger on it. We knew from the word go that the only way anybody would listen to us is if we didn't preach. You know, more than most books, we're, this book had to be friendly, if you will. It had to be casual. It had to be confident. But you, you're not going to change many minds getting up on your soapbox and lecturing everybody how they're, ever, how they're all wrong. Look, you can, you can believe anything you want about uh, Texas history. We're just trying to reclaim the actual history rather than the legend. And um, it, it's, it, it's hard. But we, we tried to be as friendly uh, as we could. Uh, I hope we've, we've pulled that off. I, yeah, I think you did. I, I want to bring in a, a, a comment or a question from a, 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 a viewer uh, from Lynn Hargrove who says, um, you're not saying that the Alamo wasn't important, are you? And I, that question can cut a lot of different ways, uh, so I'll let you have a shot at it. Well, there's two ways. Was it important to the revolution, to the military strategy of the revolution, and what is important as a symbol of Texas identity? I would argue clearly the latter is important. Whatever you think about what happened that day in March 1836, the Alamo is hugely important to the way to Texas culture, to Texas identity, to the way Texas Texans think of themselves. Was it important to the milita military campaign? Academics debate that to this day. I think the the we we come up we come to the belief that 
it's while it's not unimportant, it was the first uh, significant uh, fight between Mexican Amer and Texan forces uh, during the revolution. It's difficult to say that, you know, uh, a three week siege which killed 180 guys was particularly militarily important. Uh, a lot of people believe, Sam Hurt, Sam Houston certainly believed, that there was no uh, tactical significance to the Alamo, to the old mission, or even to San Antonio. He wanted to withdraw and defend the rivers, the north-south rivers. So I'd say it's up in the air still. It's, it's still a reason for debate whether or not it was uh, tactically significant. We feel that that's, that's been overblown. But certainly the idea of the Alamo, the image of it, the symbolism, has been hugely important to the state's cultural development. I, I don't think there's any denying that. So I want to get talk a little bit about the site itself. Um, given its importance and given the its place in Texas history and Texas identity, um, I don't think I'm being out of line by, by, by a little story from when I was growing up. You know, I was a kid. I watched the John Wayne movie. I loved it. My nan bought me the Alamo playset from Sears and Roebuck. And we make the big family trip across country, and we're going to go visit the Alamo. And I was so excited. I, I just couldn't wait. And we finally get there, and I'm like, what a what, letdown. What is it? <laughs> so, that? Get so to everybody, everybody knows. It, it's, it's unanimous. Even the Alamo's biggest backers in San Antonio, sitting on the board that runs the thing, will tell you, yeah, it's a bit of a letdown. It's a little dingy chapel uh, without a lot of signage or things that explain to you what really happened. There's a little uh, museum that's not great um, with a little film that looks like it was put together by a ninth grade history class. Look, the fact is uh, people of San Antonio and the state of Texas have been trying to figure out how to gussy up the Alamo for going on 50 years. And they've been arguing about it for 50 years. Um, you know, rolling around come the 90s, uh, the, the city fathers managed to get a lot of people on the, on the same page because let's be clear, Native Americans have been complaining about graves because the, the Alamo Plaza outside is the site of an old Native American um, a graveyard. Uh, you know, Mexican Americans, Teanos, have been arguing about its importance and their how they belong in, in, in the history just as long as Anglos have. Even African Americans have come up uh, and said, well, hey, this, this Walgreens across the street is important to civil rights because it's one of the first place blacks were able to, to dine alongside um, Anglos. So everybody had, it took forever to get everybody on the same page. They finally did in the, just in the 2010s. There is now a plan to make a world-class museum built around, and Chris, I'll nod to you because you'll know who Phil Collins is, as the, the great dr drummer of Genesis and now quite a, a singer in his own right, who has, although, and I'm surprised how many people didn't know this. I, I This was one of the few things about the Alamo I didn't know. Phil Collins is the world's greatest Alamo enthusiast. He owns yeah. the largest collection of Alamo memorabilia in the world. And this I, I have to jump in. I have to jump in here and say this was this was the shocker in your book, right? This was, this was the thing. So many people. Crockett, Bowie, Travis, I'm there, Stephen Austin, Sam Houston, Santa Ana, and then suddenly it's Phil Collins and... <laughs> Uh, and and he is so he's a huge collector, but there's that is also a story that's not free of of controversy and issues as well. Let's just say, first off, everybody loves Phil Collins. There's nobody that, that likes or doesn't like his collection. Just think he's a great guy. Uh, there's nobody that has a bad word to say Phil Collins. Now the collection, that's another thing. This collection is now supposed to be the centerpiece of a four hundred million dollar, now maybe downsized to two hundred fifty million dollar museum that is going to be a, a, a wholesale reimagining of the Alamo. Uh, it's going to be like a whole block wide park type deal. Um, the problem was, and we, look, we didn't go into this thinking we were going to be writing about Phil Collins and his collection, but we did get a tip midway through from a fairly high placed source, if you will, um, at the Alamo that Phil, that Phil's collection was not quite what it was cooked up to be. Um, there's a lot in it that's authentic, authentic, especially the documents. But uh, there is real concern among collectors and gallerists and experts that an awful lot of the most important uh, items, especially those connected to, to the Holy Trinity, if you will, as well as James Bonham and people like that, uh, have 
very little in the way of authentication papers, and some of them, many of them appear to be fakes, modern made fakes. Um, and that's a real concern when you're trying to build, a, you know, a $400 million uh, museum. Uh, so that was one of the things that got people's attention when we came out and published that, I guess, back in May uh, in, in a, an excerpt on the cover of Texas Monthly. Oh, one of the things, mm-hmm. right, I, I want to get your kind of your take on it. Um, your book is was informative. It was entertaining. I enjoyed it. I laughed. I was interested in everything. But the one part of the book that really struck me the most, um, really affected me, made me very sad, uh, was when you were talking about um, Mexican Americans and saying that you know it's yeah. not as big a deal for them as it is for Anglo Americans. But every Mexican American kid knows after the seventh grade he's different than everybody else. Yeah, and that boy, that just yeah. really. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to write about. It's hard to talk about, especially as an Anglo guy, who's you know um, bringing you the stories of people um, of another ethnicity. Um, I, I, I almost want to apologize about that up front, but it was the most shocking thing to me in the book, and, and to people who don't understand what we're talking about, what we're saying is that the Alamo legend has been used um, to kind of beat down. Latinos in the state for a long time ago, you know, envision the beefy Anglo bully, you know, hitting a little uh, Latino guy in the in the in the shoulder and saying, "Hey, remember the Alamo there, Jose?" And it's always been a way to keep Mexican Americans, Latinos, Tejanos in their places. And when you talk to as many as we did, um, both academics, politicians, Latino normal people, you hear the story over and over. I thought I was American. I believed in the Statue of Liberty. I, I thought the Declaration of Independence was about me until they taught the Alamo in seventh grade. And then I realized we're just Mexicans and we're always going to be Mexicans. And I don't, I'm not some woke lefty who throws around words like oppressive or oppression very often. The pretty strong case that culturally the Alamo legend has been used to oppress Mexican Americans in the tech in, in, in the state for a long, long time. Uh, and those who have come out and said and try to e- express their truth have been basically hooted down. Um, we cite, you know, examples of that in the book. Um, so, you know, when I hear uh, people pushing the Anglo set eccentric um, legend these days, I somehow say, wow, I bet, aren't you like me? Do you know what that story, that legend means to your Latino neighbors? I didn't, I had no clue. And we we suggest in the book softly that if more Anglos knew what that story really means to Latinos, would they be fighting so hard to preserve it? Um, I wonder. Well, that's a... um... Yeah, I mean, I think I think it, it was a, a very moving part of the book, and uh, and it's a great question. But and and look, uh, 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 Texas is changing, right? And you pointed that earlier. You're going to have probably uh, I don't know I don't know the demographics probably as well as you do, but you're going to have a um, a Hispanic uh, majority probably at some point in the near future. Hey, yeah, those are down to forty one percent. And yet, Rick, if you look at uh, again, I don't want to come off as some uh, uh, someone who's just attacking everybody, but when you look at the state government and especially the state media, it is not a lot of brown. You know, it is it is remains very Anglo, and so there's a lot of people who don't really value this lesson. They don't see that it's particularly important. There are uh, those who are well-meaning that think that it's not our 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 story. You know, we you know we don't want to get in trouble for telling someone else's story. We came to that moment in our book and realized, no, it's not. Our, we don't know. We don't. It's not our story to tell. But we wouldn't be doing our jobs as as writing a historiography if we didn't say what this meant. Why this is important. Why it matters because of what it's what it's done to you know a group of people in the state who are poised to become a majority in a year now. So so. You know, today I think it's very popular. The people use 
revisionism almost as a pejorative, and it's a misuse of the word. Um, and in the case of the the history of the Alamo, the historiography of the event, when did revisionist histories of the event kind of start being looked at and being considered and brought into the conversation? Really, and, and, and can we and can we just for the for those of us who who have trouble with long words. Uh, can we explain maybe what historiography is? Because uh, a historiography is just a history of the history. History of the history. It's not just a history of the event. It's a history of how the story came to be told the way it is. Revisionism, at least as it's popular to use, really began around the sesquicentennial of the, the battle itself and the revolution in 1986. But the first major uh, uh uh, the, the first major book of it came out in, in 1990 by a guy named Jeff Long. It's called what, Duel of Eagles. And it is a fabulously angry retelling of the Texas Revolution in which everybody who's Anglo is pretty much uh, a bad guy. And it's a little over the top, but it really turned a lot of heads and got people to start reassessing. And we say that the this was kind of the big bang of Texas re revisionism. And that the 90s was really the golden age when every few months there was a panel or a book or an academic article or a new argument on how Davy died or what this all meant. I mean, suddenly it's all everybody was talking about. 25 years later, we've forgotten that because in Texas, a very conservative framework of government came in around the turn of the century. And suddenly those for, for those who are interested in traffic in new ideas and claiming the actual history that kind of has become harder in the last um the last 20 years but chris to your point jeff long who wrote that book in 1990 said to me uh in an interview and i think he's right that the revisionism here is what happened beginning in 1836 the the the, the actual facts of the battle and the revolution were revised into this legend that made generations of Anglo-Texans feel just great about themselves. What people are trying to do now is reclaim the actual, uh, the, the actual facts of history. And that's what gets people upset because it doesn't jibe with a legend that is so central to Texas identity. And I say that, and Rick, you know, if you're from Rhode Island, you can, you can, you can sit there and say, well, you know, there are not a lot of people I know walking around in Providence talking about their identity as Rhode Islanders. Well, there are in Texas. <laughs> there are in Texas, let me tell you. This is serious stuff down here. It was serious stuff when I was in seventh grade. It was serious stuff when I went out way to college in Missouri and hung a Texas flag in my dorm room. It's, it's serious. People in Texas really do, at least those of us who've been here a while, believe that in some way, shape, or form, because we began as the only you know province or state or country to, to defeat a foreign power in war, to be an independent nation that chose to merge with the United States. Oh, hey, by the way, Rhode Island was too an independent nation a little <laughs> long before Texas, but let's not go there, okay? <laughs> yeah, I'm just saying, Rick, uh, Rick, in Texas, you know that there are people who measure their ranches in the number of Rhode Islands. I'm afraid we're having some technical difficulty with uh, with Steve right now. His sound is going out with, with Brian. I can't even remember his name. It's so upsetting, and upsetting to me. Hey, listen, I, I, but but let's let's shift gears here a little bit because I do have a very serious and important question for you, which is I have written books with a co-author. I've written two books uh, with two. Each one had a, a co-author. And uh, but I have never written a book with two other co-authors. So writing a book with three people, how the hell do you do that? Because it seems to me, how, how do you just stop there not being a fight the entire time? Um, you know, I can't say we didn't have our share. Um, uh, it helped that we liked each other. Uh, we got about two thirds of the way in and realized some uh, parts of the book were requiring a lot more work than we thought. And so one person moved off of one chunk of the book and suddenly we had two people taking you know the back the back third of the book frankly phil collins kind of blew up on us and so chris and jason really uh got in together and did an awful lot of in-person interview uh views to take that home while i remained back mostly in the 1800s um and 
um, you know, we, it came together because it had to come together. Uh, ultimately, I will say, uh, I will confess, it came to, it came in way too long. We cut, I think Chris measured, we cut 27% of the book a year ago, August. How many Rhode in, Islands is that? I just <laughs> didn't know. I that, that, was, that was a couple of months worth of work. They just ended because our editor said, there's a great book in here someplace. Would you please edit it down so I can find it? And, um, you know, we did. Chris led the way on that. I did a lot of it. Um, and the book is much, the book is two thirds of the length that it initially was. And I'll say it's a heck of a lot better than what we turned in. So let me, all of which is to say, uh, if you think it's difficult working with three uh, co-authors, it is. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's, you know, luckily we had a, a researcher, uh, my, my one time partner, Maggie Walsh, who is great at convening powwows and peace sessions. And uh, in addition to being a fabulous researcher, um, and we made it. <laughs> you know, in the end, we made it. We came out, and to my great surprise, the book, you know, became you know a top ten bestseller, and it, it is being read because I had no confidence that anybody was really going to care. Um, oh, they care, Brian. Right. They did. They care. So, so you know. One of the things is you, as you read your book, you're following the battles and the struggles of people to interpret the event, and and, and it's the, the weight of history is so heavy during all this, and, and you trace it wonderfully. Not only the events, how the site is saved, how it's interpreted, what they're doing with it now, the fight for the museum, and what that's going to look like. Given just how complex and nuanced this has become, both the myth and the reality. Can you ever get the story right? Can we ever come up with the narrative that we can all say, okay? I tend to think time and different demographics will take care of a lot of this. A lot of the people who feel most fervently uh, and believe most fervently in the traditionalist uh, Anglo-centric narrative, the, the legend, if you will, um, caught the bug from Davy Crockett. Uh, I mean, they caught it from Fess Parker and John Wayne. And those people will be slowly passing from the scene. Um, I dare say younger Texans uh, in their teens and 20s to the, today, many of them don't even get what we're talking about, why this matters so much. And so I tend to think that as Texas becomes younger uh, and certainly as it becomes less white and more uh, people of color, that a, a, an agreed upon narrative, not necessarily obviating the Anglo contributions, which were immense, but which find room for everyone's contributions. Uh, brown, black, white, everything, I think will become more accepted. You can say that's naive. It wouldn't be the last time I've been called naive on this project, <laughs> uh, but I'd like to believe that time heals all wounds. Well, we, we started the interview with you calling yourself naive, so I guess we can we can <laughs> end it with that. And certainly, if you think the Texas hate mail is bad, that. wait till you get the Rhode Island hate mail. So it's, <laughs> it's, it's coming. It's coming. So, so listen, uh, I want to thank Brian Burrow for joining us. He is the one of three co-authors of, or maybe co isn't the right word, but three authors of Forget the Alamo, The Rise and Fall of an American Myth. And both Chris and I enjoyed that book. It was terrific. And uh, I think it got a, Nancy Nallens pointed out, it got a good review in the New York Times. So um, uh, I do suggest you check it out. And Brian, thank you so much thank for so much taking for... the time to join us today and, and Hi, sharing, sharing, sharing about the book. It was wonderful. Thanks, Brian. Good luck. Thank you. So That was it's great. A second it was great time. the second time as well. It was a really, really fun show to do and, and glad to have a chance to broadcast it again. And Chris, we are now approaching the end of, vacation. of our summer vacation. It's time to go back to school. We're going to have to come back. We're going to be back in re in the flesh. I mean, to the uh -huh. degree that being here on YouTube <laughs> and Facebook is in the flesh. Careful where you take this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to stay clothed. Okay. Right. Um, but we really have four great shows to kick Absolutely. off the fall that uh, 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 we've put together for you. And so just to remind you of what those are, next week we are going to be talking about British pacifists in uh, World War II. Yeah. That's, a, that's a book. It's been getting a lot of uh, attention here in the UK. And um, 
I'm really excited about uh, the book and having having the author on to talk about one of those aspects of uh, the Second World War we don't really give a lot of thought to. So uh, I'm really looking forward to this. And then the following week, we're going to continue our Second World War theme uh, yeah. with our favorite guest. I guess he's our favorite. I mean, I he's, love all of our guests. Know, but, but He's kind of special. He he's the first kind of five-timer. This is going to be his fifth appearance on History yeah. Happy Hour. And did you order the new Jaguar for him or whatever yeah. we're getting him? <laughs> is it present? Is that, that, and that yeah. no, I, I think I forgot. So I don't, don't think I've done that. Then uh, the following week after that, we're going to talk to uh, Tim Tate, who's the author of a book, The Cold War Super Spy. So we're actually going to have two Cold War shows, Chris, because after the Cold War Super Spy, we're going to do Cold That'll War Nazi, Nazi Fugitives. Yeah, Look that's going to be cool. If you can bring Cold War Nazi Fugitives together, I mean, this is obviously... This is um, if we just bring Martians in somehow. This is meat for History Happy Hour, Absolutely. right? I mean, if only we could have a, a sort of a, a red coat victory as part of that as well, ooh, or, ooh, a, or a ooh, Scottish ooh. brigade or something, some Highlanders coming in with their uh, broadswords, then we would have a uh, and and maybe an inflatable tank, and then we would have the whole. <laughs> An inflatable broadsword. Yeah, I, I, the broadswords and the inflatable tank. We kind of know who's going to win that battle, so <laughs> it's, it's not really a, a really a close call there. Um, uh, please make sure if you're watching and you're liking what we're doing. Um, I don't know why you would, but anyway, please make sure you follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get notified about upcoming shows and it makes us feel good that we have people who like what we're doing. So, we you know, need validation. We, we do. I, I mean, everybody does. And, and we're among that group and <laughs> we, we look forward to seeing you live, 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 live. Uh, a week from today. So uh, thanks everybody for joining thanks, us. Everyone. Take care. Be safe.